Thank you for coming out to this panel. This is something that a lot of us are really excited about getting to discuss, especially here at GDC. Um, so a few months back, when I had pitched the idea of doing a panel on ethics and AI here at GDC, I actually got a lot of feedback from game devs saying ethics and AI, but we're at a games conference. If this was a social media conference or a conference that was maybe focused on machine learning, then sure, but why would we talk about ethics at a games conference? And hearing this feedback from game devs was what made me realize just how important having a panel like this should be. Especially as we're starting to see the spectrum of game AI grow into so many different areas over the past few years. When social media platforms were being built, ethical and privacy concerns were not their focus. And look at where we are today. When machine learning was brought into the education system, ethical considerations were not made and it caused major issues because of biases that had been programmed into their systems. With big data comes big responsibility. <laughs> when our panelists actually got together the other day, um, an interesting statement was made, and it was that discussing ethics had always seemed very taboo, and we wondered why. Is it because companies and individuals are scared to admit that they aren't necessarily the experts in a given field? that they actually need help, that maybe a system, game, or tool that was built by a company um, was coded with biases that could be offensive or even dangerous to some people, but where one would rather ship a product than actually have their product be scrutinized and redesigned for improvements. Through AI, we are able to do amazing things, but Without proper considerations around biases and ethical implications, things can easily go south. So today, I'm joined by some amazing developers from different areas of expertise who work with and use AI across a number of very different areas, and who have all been advocates in their respective fields around ethics and games and AI. We're going to cover quite a wide range of topics today from biases in game AI to data and privacy concerns and areas of AI that transcend from tradi traditional video games like XR and digital assistance. And then we'd like to spend some time where we open it up to the audience because we really want to see what do you all think are areas that we should all be addressing when it comes to ethics and AI. So, hello. My name is Alicia Leidecker. Uh, I'm one of the advisors here at the AI Summit, and during my day job, I work on XR as Director of Developer Experience at Magic Leap. Prior to that, I was lead AI on many of the Assassin's Creed titles. So we're gonna start off by having our panelists, if you'd like to start, Emily, um, talk a little bit about yourselves and some of the work that you do. Sure. Um, I'm Emily Short. I'm Chief Product Officer at Spirit AI. And what we do at Spirit is middleware for games. Um, so that includes a product called Character Engine, which does dialogue for NPCs and how they can respond to natural language input or other kinds of input from players. Um, and the second product, which probably has the greater application in this area, is Ally, which is a community moderation tool that looks at toxic behavior within communities and helps give community managers an opportunity to see in a triage dashboard who is causing the most trouble in this space and what are the biggest concerns that we should be looking at moderating. So we're not just waiting for things to be reported by players, but we're actually able to surface issues in the community. And obviously, the, both of those products, and especially Ally, raise a lot of questions and things that we need to think about, about how do we train to look for these things? What what data are we using? How are we tagging it? How do we decide what's offensive, what's, what's racist, what's appropriate? And then how do we make use of that information when we have it? How do we protect the privacy of the clients and of the players that are making use of the system? And then when we're applying characters that can respond to res um, input in interactions, how do we make sure that players who are interacting with those characters understand that they're interacting with an AI and they form an appropriate rather than an inappropriate kind of connection with that character? Thank you. 
Celia. Hey, so my name is Celia Hudent, and I am the least knowledgeable person about AI on this panel. Uh, my background is in uh, psychology, actually. I have a PhD in psychology. Uh, I was, uh, I'm specialized in child development and uh, development of uh, cognitive uh, psychology. And uh, I've been working in the game industry in the past 10 years. I started at Ubisoft in France, I'm French, and then moved to uh, Ubisoft Montreal. Uh, I worked at the Playtest Lab there and also worked with the uh, uh, Rainbow Six franchise. I moved to LucasArts. Uh, working on Star Wars games like 1313 that never saw the light of day, sadly, uh, and then moved to Epic Games in 2013 uh, to be director of user experience at Epic, because uh, now I'm specialized in game UX. This is how my background uh, meets game development. And so I worked on all the different products at Epic, so Unreal Engine and, of course, Fortnite. Um, I left Epic uh, late 2017, and now I'm a consultant in freelance and also wrote a book called The uh, Game is Brain. Uh, and so I'm very interested in um, understanding how we can use psychology um, in developing products for uh, good or evil. Um, so all these questions are really, really interesting to me. Awesome. Thank you. Timony. Hi, I'm Timony West. I'm the Director of Augmented and Virtual Reality Research at Unity Labs. Uh, my background was originally in a product design in social media and others, and I've spent my entire career trying to figure out how to get data from people, largely personal information, and then give it back to them in a way that makes sense and is useful for them. And when it comes to spatial computing, that has been an even bigger conversation because we are literally creating tools that let you record everything about your house, everything about the way you move or the way you're moving your device, and then try to put that boat back into the engine and then into your game or to your experience in a way where it makes sense uh, and actually adds additional value. So I fundamentally believe that if we take in information from these devices and from our users, we have an ethical consideration to give back more than we've got. And that is especially when it comes to having you know, devices that have 10 different cameras watching your every move and listening to your every breath, uh, something we really need to take seriously. So I'm glad to be here talking about it. So I'm Luke Dickin. Uh, I'm director for Central and Strategic Analytics. You might have heard me talk here yesterday. I will try not to shout at you so much today. <laughs> um, so I'm at Zynga, uh, and we are kind of well known as a, a data-driven games company. We've kind of come to prominence in maybe 2009 kind of era. Uh, you know, there are, there are quotes flying around that, oh, we're not a games company, we're an analytics company masquerading as a game studio. Um, so we've been kind of collecting a lot of data over the years, um, and I think that we, we do a, a pretty good job with it. So I'm really excited to kind of come here and talk to you about the way that we do that. Awesome, thank you. Um, so, sorry, Luke, we're actually going to start off by talking about NPCs. I know yesterday. You and I'm going to start shouting again. <laughs> about this. Um, yeah, that's fine. Let's shout, you know. Um, so, my first question to the panelist is um, what are some examples that you've seen in video games uh, where you've seen biases that might have been programmed around characters and systems AI? Anyone want to start? Yeah, try. Uh, yeah I remember um, when I was uh, uh, playing Watch Dogs, um, they, there was a lot, the, the AI was always, uh, you would see like uh, women always getting um, uh, violented and, and in trouble and uh, as a player, uh, so you're uh, um, incarnating the, um, uh, a male character and always uh, coming here to help out the women and uh, the women always uh, need uh, someone to you know, get out of that violence, and so the the, the women are in that game have, have massively portrayed as um, getting beat up and uh, needing some help. Um, I always like to diss Navi from Ocarina of Time. How many people play that? <laughs> it's not even fair. She's just clippy. I get it, but. Um, it was an early attempt to have you know, the user sort of guided and, and given context as they go through experience, but she was extraordinarily annoying. She just wanted you to stay on task, and the great thing about Ocarina was the first time you could really run around in 3D and high rule, right? So that's what you're gonna do. And she was just there being annoying, telling you to go to the next temple, and you're like, no, Navi, I just wanna ride my horse, leave me alone. So. <laughs> Anybody else? I mean, one that jumps out to me, I think, is um, 
you know, if you look at sort of systems like in RimWorld, um, RimWorld has a, a whole kind of deep simulation system, but a lot of it kind of gets represented as very, um, it, it's an example of a, a way that's very easy to get NPCs doing things that are very um, kind of uh, stereotypical because it's leaning into things like, oh, this person has a misogynist trait, this person has a misandrist trait. Mm. And it's kind of, uh, it raises some interesting questions about like, does that actually need to be part of the AI system and what we're actually kind of representing? Or is there something kind of, uh, I guess it comes back to the question of taboo, right? Mm. Like if, if it's taboo for us to talk about it here, is it taboo for us to like, Express it. Exactly. Hmm. So it was interesting for RimWorld because that was one programmer, one AI programmer who decided to program what they thought the rules were for how men and women should behave in the game and how sexuality um, should behave in, their, in that game. Um, what ended up happening is the community ended up going on Reddit and basically demanding the programmer to remove some of those biases. And the only reason that that person made changes was because the community demanded for it. So what do we think that we could actually do to help um, put in place processes? Or how can developers be more mindful about coding systems without biases that have been put in place? Well, I think some of, some of the approaches that we see brought into narrative contexts around having sensitivity feedback, having people comment who belong to particular groups that might have a little bit of more understanding of kind of what does this portrayal mean for us, what does this kind of representation likely to convey about us, have a look at the work and give some feedback and intentionally seeking out sensitivity players um, has been really useful for story games. And I think it's, it's entirely possible to bring that kind of approach also into looking at systemic representations. Um, and I would add to that, it's not necessarily the case that systemically representing uh, negative attitudes on the parts of, of characters, like having a racist character is not necessarily inherently evil, but I think it's, it's we need to be careful about how we represent and unpack that. Um, and so having people be able to intentionally seek that kind of feedback about their system is quite important. Actually, that, that is a curious thing about being the creator of a system. If you're trying to mimic a real world system, you may or may not agree with. Because just inherently in creating and defining the system, it sort of feels like you're giving it the thumbs up, even if you're not. You know, like, like I, because I am replicating this, I feel like the sort of implicit uh, acknowledgement that the system is here, even if I completely disagree with it. It's so just an interesting tension. There's no real solution there. Um, I know when we were on our call the other day, uh, we brought up some interesting discussions around just what the role of a programmer uh, for systems and AI means, and actually about the education of programmers. I think a few of us brought up how, who here, um, actually who's a programmer, has done some type of ethical class when you were in university? A lot of us, right? Or quite a few of us. I remember personally for myself that it was kind of that class that you didn't take seriously. Um, <laughs> and it was actually very focused on business rather than actual ethical um, areas that we should consider as programmers. So what do we think that we can do on the education side for programmers and designers? Maybe don't even call it ethics. It doesn't really matter what the ethics are. That's like a a social thing, you know, it changes from country to country or even region to region, but just being able to create or have a class that teaches you the underlying socialization systems so that you can confirm your own bias and know that it's a bias, right? Recognize which part is, is the socialization aspect and how it differs across different cultures. And, and then it takes out the, is this good or bad? And it's just like, this is a tendency that you have. Acknowledge it and then see if you want to build it into the system you're designing or not. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe we should call call it unconscious bias uh, more than ethics because ethics is, is a set of values that we decide and who who is deciding how we decide it's it's complicated. But if we talk about unconscious bias and we explain that as humans we are fallible and we all have biases, and it's okay we need to admit it and accept it, um, but then we need to work around it because we can't even if we know our biases we still can't get away from them. Uh, so we need to design the environment to go around them. The um, the example of 
I'm going to try to do that fast. But the example of if you want to hire more women, um, you, it's, we are discriminated against women, even, even women against other women. And so if you take the example of the orchestra, I think it was in uh, Boston, they wanted to hire more women because they figured that, well, how come we don't have that many uh, musicians in our, uh, in our, in our group um, that are women? And so to avoid um, being discriminated against women, they started to do blind in, um, uh, auditions. So they were uh, a curtain and they couldn't see. And also later on they added um, 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 carpets because they could still hear uh, the high heels of the women. And, but after they um, added the carpet and the, the curtain, uh, then uh, they hired, uh, I think it was um, plus uh, 30 to 50 more percent, 50 more percent women uh, in the orchestra. So we are biased, it's happening, we, we have to acknowledge it and we have to understand how it works and how we perpetuating them. And so in AI or in any system, if we don't take that into account, we are gonna um, perpetuate all these discriminations. I'm just gonna give one more example from AI. Um, that I love that example because uh, uh, it's pretty clear. Um, if in Turkish, uh, there is no gender when you talk. So uh, so uh, she is a doctor, he is a doctor, it's going to be the same phrase. You don't have he or she in when you talk in Turkish. Uh, so if you uh, Google Translate, uh, he is a doctor or she is a doctor, you will have the same phrase that I'm not going to say because I don't speak Turkish at all, uh, but you have the same phrase for both of these uh, different phrases in, uh, in English. Now, if you take that phrase from Turkish um, and you put it in Google Translate and you translate it back into English, then you have, he is a doctor. Now, if you take the phrase uh, in Turkish that says, he or she is a nurse, and you put that in uh, Google Translate, you get, she is a nurse. And so where there's no gender in one language uh, through uh, AI algorithms, uh, we, it's, it's gonna perpetuate some discriminations. So this is where we're at, we need to take that into account. And if we want more equity, we have to find a workaround. So actually, I, I agree with what you were just saying, but I wanna make the case for Ethics is about more than just the biases. Mm -hmm. Biases are very important, but I think as a, as a culture, we need more training in ethical thinking and how it works in general. Um, and maybe that's everybody needs to watch The Good Place a lot more. <laughs> um, but I feel like one of the things that's happened is that because we have, for many reasons, and you know, we, uh, historically, a lot of this kind of thinking about how do we figure out what is good and bad has either been in the realm of, of fairly academic philosophy or it has been expressed within a religious context and moving away from those contexts, especially as more and more people like don't necessarily share the same backgrounds, we need to have ways of talking about these problems. Like how do we decide what is good and bad? Like that's a, it's, humanities, you know, we got to still have them in schools. So I think it's, it's broader than just identifying the set of issues. It's, it's about like building that whole framework of philosophy. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, Cecilia was talking about, like, all we're doing is measuring the vector differences between words that are close together. And that is how you get she is a nurse and he is a doctor. But that's also how you get he is a doctor. We're just, you know, something's running through a bazillion words and trying to figure out which words are close enough to each other that you can predict which word comes next. That's how it works, right? So if on top of that we want to say, but don't say he or she, that's where we need this ethical framework of like, okay, go back through the data set again and now do basically kind of a ethical fix. But the interesting thing, <laughs> like... <laughs> of, of the data. So yeah, where we get that list. What is the list? Who defines the list? Where's who that finds list? It, who validates it? How That's do we right. get it part of our process? How but we, we already uh, have it, right? I mean, do we? well, is it in your pocket? <laughs> <laughs> in as much as it's everything. Yeah. So I mean, it's really easy for us to kind of step away from like fiddling about with with demographic words in particular. Yeah. But like everybody in this room knows what an imbalanced data set is, and if you have an imbalanced data set, you know that you need to do something about it. So like, if you can take that, that kind of tool set across everything mm -hmm. and then start applying that to places where you're not necessarily applying it right now, is that what a fix looks like? Just how do you account for cultural differences? There are countries where women cannot be doctors. 
I mean, I feel like if we are, had an actual we answer, we wouldn't be water? here, we'd be off doing it. Yeah, fair, fair. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, it's true. Um, so moving on from NPC AI, there's a lot of different areas and different types of games that use AI, um, from social games to online games. Um, Celia, I know you had some areas you wanted to discuss around like how we could be using AI data better to improve those types of games. I don't know if you want to talk to that. Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, no, I think the the only thing that was it was just to go back to my previous point. Yeah. Uh, we our society is is not we don't have equity, um, and we I mean uh, a lot of people want equity. I think if we can agree to that, then we need to figure out what is it that we are uh, showing. Uh, you know, what are the biases that are perpetrating in our games? Uh, that it's not just our games. Uh, to be fair, uh, it's perpetrating in in everything. Uh, um, uh, social media and, and uh, in movies and books or whatever, uh, but we are also participating into that because uh, we are part of the of the culture. And so, um, um, a lot of people play games now. So, what what do we want to reinforce there? Are we going to reinforce uh, discrimination uh, towards women and towards uh, uh, people of color? Um, um, so, what? what is it we want to actually, how do we want to participate? Because we are gonna reinforce some discrimination uh, or we can reinforce a, a better vision of, of the world. So since we are participating, even if we don't mean to, what do we want to do? How do we want to participate? So coming back to, <laughs> sorry, online. <laughs> Um, online and social games, and I think like it's mostly a, a few of you here, especially Luke at Zynga as well, and then from Fortnite. Um, they're very different types of games that aren't just about the biases um, for characters, but how you're using ADI data to influence those games in different ways. What do you guys think about that, or what are some initiatives that you've done um, on your sides? So one of the things that we do is we definitely don't feed demographic information into machine learning algorithms partly because that would be wrong. Uh, it's partly because we don't trust our demographic information. Uh, it turns out that a lot of millennials lie to everybody they can online. Um, so as a result of that, like it, it's, we know that it's not necessarily the most reliable data, so we don't actually use it as a basis for anything. But that's an example of like how you can be a little bit more kind of buttoned up about this stuff. Like, you know, machine learning in general takes the, the view that, hey, throw all the data into the machine and see what comes out, it's magic. Um, but you can be a bit more intentional about it and you can kind of um, be a bit more structured and kind of, you know, we, we gather a lot of kind of in-game behavior data. Um, you know, as you're playing through the game, we fire off counters for probably too many things, frankly, given what's in our database. Um, but at the same time, like, we can use that to actually back into a model of your player journey. And then from there, kind of understand, that, like I was talking about yesterday, kind of what you like and dislike about the game and what you're, what's resonating with you. That feels like um, there's like two different ways you can go with that, right? There's the, the kind of black hat, okay, let's just milk you for as much money as we can and then throw you to the curb. Um, there's also the way that you can kind of approach it, which is like, let's actually work with you to provide a good experience. And I think, I think some of it is intentional, right? Like if I come at it saying, hey, I'm just, you know, I'm an evil corporation and uh, my comms team is gonna fucking hate me saying this stuff. Um, but if I'm, you know, if I come at it with, with that hat on, then that's probably not super ethical. Whereas you can, you can just change the framing and use the same kind of approach, but do it in a much kind of uh, better way. Uh, this actually came up this morning. I was talking to, to Ingrid Yesto, who's our head of monetization at Unity, and we have the ability to uh, map and track player behavior and change the game on the fly as a result. And the reality is we could be manipulating the heck out of our users constantly. So the ethics of how long and how addictive gameplay should be are top of mind, and we're actually working with the university right now to think about that. And I think that, that again, goes back to we have the problem, we know the potential bias or the, the potential problem area, but then we also need to have an ethical base on which to make these decisions. Because what is the cutoff? Is it a thousand hours of gameplay like in a row? If you spend two grand on one mobile game, do we cut you off? Do we, should we have the ability to cut you off? It should be a percentage of income. Maybe you're rich and $2,000 is nothing. I don't know. The, but obviously it's not good for anyone to waste their life 
or their money on these on these trivial things. So anyway, it's something that we're thinking about quite a bit. Who are some of the people that you're working with to help synthesize that data? Because like Celia was saying, coming from a psychology background, it would think, I would think that working with experts on that field is who we should be really like synthesizing and going through the data with, rather than just the product owners or the programmers on that side. Um, so have you uh, done any like consulting with, with game companies um, that are trying to figure out what to do with all of that data? And then same question for you, Luke. How are you synthesizing all the data that you're collecting from Zynga? I mean, one of the things that, that we do kind of poorly is the psychology side of things. We are very stats-oriented. Um, and, and I think that's partly because we actually don't have a user research group. We have a like a, a kind of marketing and consumer insights kind of focus test group, and then we have the analytics team. And if you have an analytics team, they like numbers, and they don't necessarily like people. Um, <laughs> so they're going to focus more on the numbers. But it's definitely something that we could probably do more on. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I, so I do a lot of consulting now, and usually people ask me to help them uh, offer a better experience to their players, so that there is that empathy, that, that this, this willing for empathy. Um, but then you never, you never know how things are gonna be used, because even if I, if I explain um, things like um, uh, behavioral psychology and how we react to uh, a reward, especially, uh, in a variable schedule of reinforcement, just like in loot boxes. And I explain, you know, this is, uh, this is exciting in, in, in a lot of cases. That's why we love to play dice. Or uh, if you have critical hit, it's exciting. So most, in most of the time, you know, in, in games, uh, these things are exciting. Now, if you apply that to monetization, form of loot boxes, then you actually pay money in it. And it becomes a little bit of a problem because they are using something that is engaging, that we know it's engaging to make money. Now, is it a bad thing to try to make money when we see all the studios that are closing uh, and it's actually very difficult uh, to survive when you make free-to-play games? I don't know. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard because now a, a lot of people talk about how uh, psychology is used for, for evil. Um, we can use it you know, to, um, for dark patterns, but we can also use it to nudge people and to uh, make people make better choices for their health or financial decisions. So this is, this is where it's not clear. Um, there's, there's more people outside of the gaming industry than now asking me for consulting uh, to, for questions around uh, inc inclusion and diversity um, more than the game industry so far. Um, so we keep kind of bringing up data, and ethics and AI is kind of nothing unless we are talking about ethics and data collection and privacy. Um, Emily, I know when we had the call, uh, both you and uh, Luke had talked about uh, different standards and regulations that you had used to put in place in your products and in your games. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So in, in the EU, um, because we're working across sort of multiple continents. Um, in the EU, we have GDPR, which for people who are not familiar with this, um, is a regulation about how companies are allowed to store and process and apply personal information that they have from their players and users. And it means that you have to be very specific up front if you're collecting data. You have to let people opt out of having their data collected or used. You have to let them know if somebody places a request. Um, they can actually, as a matter of transparency, ask what data you have on them. Um, and then as a corporation, you have to um, keep track of like what kind of status do I have relative to this data? Am I just storing it or am I a processor of the data? Um, so it's a, it's a huge sort of piece of bureaucratic um, overhead which made a lot of people very frustrated and very, uh, it took up many, many man hours um, and woman hours, person hours to, um, to make this thing work. Um, but I think that's the only way that we get around uh, the sort of very strong incentives that exist for corporations to just 
consume as much data as possible and then do whatever the heck they want with it. And one of the other really important pieces about GDPR is that it has a really serious fine attached. So it's the larger of uh, 20 million euros or 4% of your global revenue, which is enough to make a difference to a Google or a Facebook to actually make them pay attention to this kind of thing. And I think that's something that we need to think about. We can identify a lot of issues and problems um, and things that we hope that you know, people who are in a position of power within individual institutions are going to take seriously. We hope that they're going to apply these ethical considerations and we can talk about that and we can try to create, you know, cultural standards and norms about how they should be behaving. But I think the business incentives in some cases and especially around big data collection and big data use are so strong that we really do need the effect of government regulation in order to keep that um, within parameters that are acceptable. And for the audience, what's GDPR? That was just what I was explaining. What's it, what's what, it stand for? Oh, uh, general data. I, I actually don't remember the okay. uh, GDPR. It, it, you just have been chanting yes. GDPR for so long. I don't actually remember what the acronym, st acronym stands for. General Data Protection Regulations. All right. And are you using the same at Zynga? I mean, you have to. Yes. Like, it, it's an EU mandate. <laughs> so <laughs> if you don't want the fines, you have to be compliant with this thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, we had a, a pretty big initiative internally, partly because of the very significant fines, but also it, it is actually a, a, I don't want to say it's the gold standard for, for what privacy and, and kind of personal data regulation should look like, but it, it feels like a really good first swing at kind of government legislation around this stuff. I agree. Yeah. Uh, Unity also supports, supports GRDP. Um, actually, when you were talking, it made me realize something I hadn't before, which is we talked, and when I was just talking with Ingrid about how we, should at least think about whether or not we have a responsibility to cut off players who are spending too much of their time or money. Uh, somehow ads gets like a free pass on this. I had a friend who told me she stopped using social media and she stopped buying as much stuff because every third Instagram photo is actually an ad for something you probably were considering buying, just bought, or probably will want to buy. And we don't really talk about the ethics of that. Like how much money, how much more stuff can you buy in a year on the internet before the great ads God in the sky says no more, <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> hmm. I mean, I read, run an ad blocker so much of the time that I managed to <laughs> yeah, I mean, not me encounter too, this. But, but yeah, I mean, it is, it is insidious because Facebook, so, so this, is, this is like my personal story about how much I hate this, right? Like I changed my Facebook status to engaged and that same day I started to see Facebook ads for weight loss. Like, wow. and it was, it was completely obvious, like, what was going on in the creepy little mind of the algorithm back there. So, um, but anyway, um, I, I don't know, I mean, I think that the, the ads question is even harder than the question of where do we cut off people in free to play? Because in free to play, you at least have the record of like, oh, this customer spent this much money and it's a lot. Maybe this isn't a good idea. Um, and so you could have kind of internal standards of, you know, how much is, how big is the whale allowed to be, basically. Um, so you can think about that kind of thing, but when you get into the ad space, it's very hard to know what effect the ads might be having on the person. I didn't sign up for any of these weight loss programs as it happens, so unsuccessful there. So, you know, it's kind of tricky to know, but it's a, it's a valid question. Yeah. So. But, but the thing is, what is it that we're value? What is it that we're measuring? What is it that makes your investors happy? Is that how much money you're making, right? What are the profits you're making? So if this is what, what we're measuring, and we're not measuring if people are happy using your product or if you give them a better life, that's the whole question about um, what uh, Tristan Harris is, is going around with the uh, economy of attention. And, and you know, what, what is it we're measuring? What is it we want to offer to our people? Because um, we don't, like Facebook, they, they measure or how, many, uh, how much you engage where, uh, with the uh, advertisement. They don't measure if you actually have a better quality of relationship with your friends. So what is it we measure? Because this is what is, is going to drive the algorithm or whatever to um, um, optimize it. Um, so we know that, for example, like the reason why clickbait is working that well is that outrage is making us react. And this is something that makes us like, spend a lot of time on Twitter and get like, ah, ah, all excited about something. So if we measure, if the thing that we want to optimize is people clicking on the link, then all of a sudden their algorithm, of course, is going to favor all the big claims and the stuff that's going to actually make us fight each other. And so it has a terrible impact on 
our relationships, our society. So what is it we want to measure? What is it we want to optimize? Is it always making profits and making you know, the, best, the most clicks, or the most views? Yeah, exactly. Like, it doesn't matter what ethical standards we have. If some PM's KPI for this quarter is to increase activations 25%, and you're like, well, you know, it doesn't quite match up, that doesn't matter. They don't get their bonus, or they, they, they lose the respect of their peers. If you want to go to a little bit more high level, they, they're seen as a bad worker. Like, we need to have what people do for a living and what they're rewarded for financially and, and, and you know, socially match up to the ethics or they're just not going to implement it, which is what we're seeing today. Yeah. I mean, I, I seem to be up here making big statements, but I think that part of what we see is that it is hard to debug the system, the systematic incentives, without sort of taking here are the results. This is the kind of results that we're seeing is AI is allowing us to take what we were already doing much further than before, and we're seeing bad results from that. But what that is telling us is that we need to debug capitalism. Like, it's not just, it's not just the machine learning that needs to be fixed, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a system. We can manipulate it. Just yeah. turn it in a different direction. It Everyone be still gets to make a lot of money, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, but anyway, that's... So on a go way off of data, um, Timony, you mentioned this in your introduction, but to do XR experiences, yeah. it's even more important today to get as much data about the real world around you. You mentioned that what you want to know is see what the user sees, hear what the user hears, um, but there are a lot of discussions that are currently happening around what does that mean and what do we expose to developers and to users. Yeah. Um, so what are your thoughts around that? collect as much data as possible so there's too much and then no one can do anything with it. <laughs> um, honestly, I tend to be pretty laissez-faire about data collection. I, use, I briefly worked for the State Department and it was very Kafkaesque and I walked away thinking, there's, this is not gonna turn into a police state. They're not that organized. But, and if we get to a police state anyway, that's always a question, right? It's always like, oh well, people have your data and you don't know what they're gonna do with it. And if in the future, they just, you're, you're suddenly on the bad list because you did some, had something in the past that was recorded, uh, you're fucked. Okay, you are. But if we get to the point where we do suddenly turn America into a police state, we have a lot of other problems as well. And I don't know if data collection is top of the list necessarily. That being said, I do know people in the audience who have been on lists and therefore going to the airport sucks for them or because of their name, because of how they look. So I, I, I do want to be sensitive to that. Um, there are a lot of inroads right now into new ways of anonymizing personalized data. The biggest problem right now is it tends not to be performant because you can only perform calculations on encrypted data, which doesn't work well on mobile devices, which is basically what AR HMDs are, for example. Um, but I think as computers get faster and smaller, we'll continue to see inroads in being able to basically obfuscate parts of the data set so that you can have a personalized experience, but it doesn't tie back to you personally. But then there's a whole other question of you probably do want a digital identity that's tied to you personally as you go from space to space or room to room in other people's homes and you want to see what they have or they want to give you permission to see the digital goods in their in their house. Uh, but that's, that's kind of far At field. At that point, do you end up with the same thing if you walk in to go shopping for a wedding dress and you walk <laughs> out and you see a digital ad about weight loss that says this way? Um, yeah. So yeah. the same. Loop. And digital ad blockers. <laughs> um, kind of riffing on the XR side, uh, we're seeing a lot of talk. I think every platform is talking about doing um, digital characters in the real world. Um, also with Spirit AI, like your whole focus is about how do you create these interactions and build like AI systems to interact with digital characters. We're also seeing where how many people in here have Alexa or Google Home at home quite a few, um, and essentially that is also a digital character just without the visual aspect of it. Um, there's a lot of talk about kind of the humanizing side of things, and again, what do we do with data, and how do we design these digital characters to not have these biases similar to what you were talking about with watchdogs? 
So what do we all think about that? Well, I think <laughs> what, what we're seeing, at, especially with some of the clients that we're talking to, are use cases, like there, there's the use case of it's just a digital character or an assistant in your home for adults, but there are also especially a lot of use cases that are even more sensitive than that. So cases where um, people want to create an educational character, a toy, you know, it's an educational game series that where this character kind of lives with your child for a period of years and it has DLC that like teaches your kid stuff and remembers things about what your kid likes. And of course that like runs smack into like all of the sort of child data protection issues, but also a lot of sort of subtler things about like, what does it even mean if you've got a, a sort of an educational program that is shaping itself in response to the child? And like, what are your responsibilities about what you teach them and don't teach them? And it, it gets very diamond age and it's kind of strange, um, but that's an interesting area. And then the, another big sort of point of use is in cases of um, people who've experienced trauma or who are suffering with autism um, and uh, have or, or whose parents um, kind of want to help them get through uh, learning to interact socially. I probably shouldn't say suffering with autism. That's not a, a good way of putting it. But um, so in cases where the finding is that some people in some situations actually find it easier to talk to a digital character than to another human. But then you're, again, creating a context where there's the potential for the AI to do a lot of good, right? There's the potential for the AI to make somebody comfortable talking about something that they don't want to talk to a human being about because they're ashamed or because they're uncomfortable for whatever reason. So that is, that's high value, but it's, also, it's a high risk, high reward kind of um, situation because it's such a vulnerable space, you could also do considerable harm. Um, so I think there, again, a lot of the kind of impetus is on making sure that the people who are working on these materials are coming to it with the background of kind of educational experience and psychological experience, that it is not just a product being formed by an entrepreneur who like came up with this because it was an easy story to tell to VCs. Like, it needs to come from some place of a much deeper understanding than that. This is where I always get into, we need to tell the computer no, and the computer needs to be able to hear that and react to it and record it for future context, right? Like, now today if Siri starts playing uh, music or Alexa, I, I'm like, no, no, not that song. No, you're all wrong. No, not Amazon Music, whatever. But this needs to be the case for all, especially in XR, when things are going to be coming up to you or trying to attach themselves to you or pin themselves to places in your home, you have to be like, no, that's wrong, no, that's wrong, no, that's wrong. We're already be able, starting to be able to do this with ads in a really systemic way because the ads follow you all around the internet. So oddly, it's like kind of a good use case. Um, but yeah, that we need to be able to tell the computer no, which means that we have to have that in every piece of software, the listener that listens to the no and records the no. Um, there's also the idea of, as we start seeing that there's more and more AI happening all around us, do we have a responsibility to start explaining to people what is an AI and what is not an AI? Um, I was at a conference once and we were talking about Alexa and a few people that were there were telling me that their little kids started yelling at their parents because the parents had said, Alexa, play song X. And the children um, yelled back at the parents saying, you didn't say thank you to Alexa. And basically, the, the people had said that children are growing up where they feel that Alexa is part of the family, um, that it's a real person. And as we're starting to see these digital characters come into the real world around us with XR to these um, smart home objects and really AI everywhere, what do we think we need to start thinking about? Like, how do we explain to users this is an AI versus this is not real? I think it's it's actually, I didn't look this particular point up before this panel, so I may be misremembering, but I believe it's the case that the state of California law is that if you have a chatbot or something similar to it, that if the user asks if it is AI, it has to respond correctly. Like, it has to admit that it is AI. You cannot have a character that is going to say, no, I'm just a customer service agent. Um, you know, I'm Tim, and I'm here to help you. Um, and I, that's clearly... It kind of there, there's a particular sort of customer service context in which that could be important is like, you know, if as a human user, I really need to make sure that I'm getting accurate information back from this company that I've got somebody that I can hold to it or whatever. There, so there's kind of a specific local case. Um, but I think more broadly, it is 
important for people to understand kind of what they're interacting with. And they, the thing that I keep thinking about in this context is that many years ago, so I made a, a, a game very early in my career that was a conversation game where you're talking to this character. And um, it was a very like low fidelity, it was all text, you were interacting with it by typing, so nobody was gonna be confused that it was like physically a person. Um, but at one point I got this email from this guy who said like, thank you for making this game, Galatea. Like I keep it on my phone, she's become my best friend and I talk to her every day. And I felt like, thanks, but I'm actually really quite concerned right now. Um, and so like that, that seems to me to suggest like some other areas where we need to be careful, right? Like, you know, it's, is it okay to be using AI characters to resolve loneliness? Is that maybe that's a good thing? Maybe, it, maybe it's a little disturbing and. So, uh, sorry. I just, um, so I agree with all that. It's just uh, because of my child development background. Um, I just want to <laughs> mention one thing. Uh, children have a tendency to animate things that are inanimate. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not so sure about that part. Do they really not understand that uh, Alexa is not a real person? Because children will have a tendency to say, oh, you kiss me goodnight. You have to kiss uh, my, my doll goodnight as well. So I just want to make sure that we are not saying that kids are not able to um, discriminate between the, the two. I wonder if we can come up with a new way of human, I mean, we do this all the time, right? To your, to your point, or, you know, you, if I make two circles and I'll smiley face, everyone's like a face. We're really good at pattern recognition. And I wonder if over time we'll just start to create this new space for these digital creatures. There, there are several um, excellent companies that make AIs that help people through depression and suicide and have great search, or great, um, great results. And I would not want that to stop. That's awesome, right? And clearly they've defined this relationship to this digital being that works for them, uh, knowing that it's not human because it's, it's very clear when you, when you go there. And I love that. I love that use of the technology. What I don't like is when people kind of humanize uh, the sort of malicious intent, like, oh, it's all going to be Skynet and they're going to destroy us and we deserve it by God, you know? <laughs> now that's just you projecting. <laughs> So yeah, I, I maybe in, in teaching people about what AI is, we can start to come up with a language that allows for that middle ground where this is made by humans and it's designed to be interacted with by humans, but it is something else. Yeah, I mean, I think if you present it as, like this is an extension of the people or people who created it and they do you know, want you to recover from whatever you're, you're dealing with or whatever, there is a personal connection being made through the AI, but it's not, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that kind of transitions into our last question I want to ask everyone before we open it up to Q&A. Um, we're all passionate about AI and the ethics around it because I think we all inherently believe that AI can do a lot of good in the world around us. Um, so what are some recommendations you can give to the audience, ideas, um, areas you wish for this whole community to start driving AI towards? Let's just start. Oh, I can start. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, look into look into psychology and try to understand how we influence people. We all influence other people, and we are influenced by our environment. Uh, so we need we need to understand that better, understand uh, um, behavioral psychology better. Uh, not just for to make more money and to uh, hook people up, um, but we need to we need to understand how we can use it to. Um, favor equity and to make people like feel better because also it's at some point it's going to be a good uh, business drive uh, to have a trust relationship uh, with uh, your customers and that you uh, treat them with respect and uh, make them happy in the end and not just like make them pay, 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 pay because if this, this is the only metrics that you have, then of course you're going to uh, favor that. So look into, look into these things around to understand it. And again, don't, this is not about, oh, you're a bad person. We, all, we are all uh, biased and we have to be in peace with that so we can actually move, move on and uh, um, I solve the problems that we want to solve. So I, I would add on to that, because um, it's really cool to be like, okay, well, now we are in the psychology portion and we're gonna now think about that, but bring that lens to everything. Like, literally every decision you make, make it intentfully around what Celia's talking about, because it's really easy to like sideline it and go, cool, we're gonna make a, a whole bunch of systems, we're gonna throw a whole bunch of stuff out, and here's the kind of like ethics bit. <laughs> but bring it to everything. The ethics module. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I think another area, and this is this is a little bit of a tangent from from some of the things that others have suggested, but but I think the fact that machine learning tends to take our biases and exaggerate and expose them, and that like causes embarrassment sometimes, and that's a reason why we need to be careful about the balance of our data and so on, but it is also a way in which um, the process of working in an AI gets us to think about the systems that we're part of in general. Um, what is embedded in the world around us and in the data around us all the time that we ignore out of being used to seeing it that way or sort of a general level of comfort or having incentives not to notice it. Um, so first of all, sort of a practice of interrogating the things that we build with AI and saying like, all right, well, what is this expressing back to me? And not only is it broken, but also what is that telling me about humanity and the systems around me? And should that perhaps be addressed in some way? Um, and then the, there, that there's tremendous potential in our ability, and this, this does get back more into the kind of games and simulation space again, um, to build models of how we think pieces of the world maybe should be and explore whether we're satisfied with that, you know, potential way of doing things so that we can then move towards more just remediation in the real world. Uh, I just have three things to write down to Google later. Uh, the first is homomorphic encryption, which I sort of vaguely referenced as a way of anonymizing data sets. The second is differential privacy, which is another technique used to do basically the same thing. And then finally, and this kind of builds on what everyone is talking about, um, I highly recommend uh, Shane Parrish's Farnham Street, which is an online rationalist community that has a wide directory of different uh, systems of thought and mental models and collection of biases. So if you want to delve into how you can start thinking more clearly and accurately, there's a lot of online communities, um, but that one is a great place to start. Cool. Um, my final one would be consider accessibility. Um, and how do you create systems that can ensure equal opportunity and equal accessibility of people getting to try your systems? Whether this is from a video game and making a video game where the system is not just about killing and shooting, but how do you make um, systems that allow the users to do many different types of interactions to having digital characters in the real world? Not everyone has access to the hardware. Not everyone is going to have access to systems. So thinking about how can we make and build this community to be accessible to everyone. So we've got nine minutes left. Um, we'd love to do some Q&A. Um, please ask any question. This is a list of references that our panelists had put together of books that we recommend reading, a lot of articles that dive into things from machine learning to standards and regulation. So please take some pictures. But um, we would love to hear from you. Over here, I can't see. Is that Neil? Yeah. Um, some of this echoes earlier GDCs, or perhaps it was CGC, CGDC back then. Um, CompuServe and Genie had the same issues. They called it a credit card meltdown. That is it uh, ethical to let someone, for example, a, a sailor on a nuclear submarine who spent six months underwater, comes home and melts his credit card with online charges playing games on Genie and CompuServe. Um, and my suggestion there is that you'll know we've done this if we're not back here in 10 or 20 years doing the very same set of questions. Hmm. Um, it's, and, and perhaps there is even more history for us to go mine along this stuff. Uh, you've all talked about the idea of uh, labeling data in terms of the happiness and contentment that it provides for people. So, can you say a little bit more about any ideas that you have as to how we might go about that? Can you, can you repeat that? Go about... Sure. So, so you've talked about the fact that if, if we label our data sets instead of with the amount of attention grabbed or the number of dollars uh, we, we get from a person, instead we label our data with the satisfaction and happiness that it may have created for the user of an app or a game or a web page or an ad or whatever. Um, could you say, because it's easy to be glib about that, and I, I feel the panel is maybe an opportunity to do a little th out loud thinking about how we might label our data for happiness. So the question was, in short, how do we label our data for happiness? Sorry, I'm supposed to be re repeating questions. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, 
it seems like probably more of a, a reinforcement learning kind of thing, perhaps, where it's not so much that you start out with labeling, I know that these things are going to lead to happiness, but I'm detecting something. Um, but then that leaves the heuristic completely undefined. So, um, I mean, I don't know <laughs> um, is the short answer, but I think it probably, it, our best attempts to work that out, I think, I'm, I am definitely thinking out loud, so thanks for permission to do that. Um, I think it's going to be very much on kind of a case by case and product by product basis, like what kinds of things in the context of this particular situation um, would equate to happiness. Um, and there, I mean, there are all sorts of things that you can do with sentiment analysis and stuff like this, like what, how, like how much expression are you getting back from the user, right? So this starts to get into territory where, where I actually have done some prior thought about it because one of the things that we're interested in um, with character interactions is being able, how do we tell from inputs that we might have from language, from facial expressions, from gestures, um, that the user is in a particular mood. Um, but, something that you had entirely trained to um, you know, be reinforced if the user is smiling and like, let's all smile at our computer all the time. It's like right. super yeah. creepy. So <laughs> clearly that's not really the answer, but I, but I think there are some things where basically, if we're in, what, what we really need in order to train towards that is something where the user or interactors um, experience is pretty expressive um, because otherwise we're training against inputs where all we have is like, oh, you you completely watched this entire YouTube video end to end and that makes me think that you would like to watch these other <laughs> creepy, like even more politically reactionary uh, videos from end to end. And we've seen where that leads. So I don't know, but I think it's, I think there are sort of things to, to delve into um, especially like starting out in the spaces where we have a lot of information about how the user is reacting like XR. So I would probably say, and I'm thinking out loud as well, uh, but you know, adding on to what Emily's saying there, like the YouTube example is a single kind of axis of, of thing. Like I think that expressive things like happiness and sentiment and that kind of thing are going to be like multidimensional. Yeah. So if you define it in terms of, so as I was kind of sat here thinking about it, um, you know, retention for us might be a, a good one as a proxy for, for happiness, ex except it's not really. <laughs> because if you take that to the ultimate extreme, then the AI system optimizes for sending somebody to your house and saying, fucking play the game. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that if you actually track kind of multiple axes, then you end up with a, a more intricate function that allows you to capture something, but that's not yeah. super actionable. I mean, there's also immediate pleasure versus long-term happiness, yeah. which, I mean, as humans, we're not even particularly good at working that out. I've, <laughs> I don't know. So, that's yeah. why we need nudges Yeah. In psychology. Uh, but also, look at uh, what Tristan Harris is doing. This is exactly these questions that he's exploring the ethicist. Um, because, like, for example, if you're a Tinder, uh, what are you going to measure? Are you measure the time that people are spending on, t on Tinder, but ideally you want people to match with other people and, and have fun with them, and so therefore not being on Tinder. Mm. So what is it we're measuring? What is it we're trying to accomplish and how we can uh, make sure that we, we can uh, have a business and still provide what we want to offer to our, uh, to our clients? That's UX, so you want to actually offer the experience you want to offer and not just have like a business orientation. Uh, we're going to go to the next question. We have, I think, room for two, maybe three more. Hello. Uh, sorry if I stutter. I'm a little nervous. Oh, no. Uh, being re realist, uh, realistic, it will be probably a long time before I ha we have like, like global regulation in AI ethics. Uh, so how can we go about justifying uh, like for producers and managers that we have to care about these things? Uh, like, for example, in the Facebook ad about weight loss, uh, how could we just find uh, that we shouldn't show that ad, uh, even though it's, if we show, we know that it can perf perform well, maybe. Uh, and in a different realm, uh, like uh, in the realm of diversity, for example, uh, there is a lot of research about uh, why it's important to have like 
diverse teams and like uh, so we can use this information to justify to the managers why it's important. Uh, so are there uh, is there any studies being done like oh we if we are more ethical we can also perform better and how so, so that's a great question we're asking um the, the, the platforms for ethics and AI just doesn't exist today. And this is why we're talking about it and trying to see like what people can do. So two questions there. One, what can we do to help inform um, producers, people on teams to think about ethics? And then what are some of the trainings that already exist that we can share with managers? Um. <laughs> I say there's more studies on how diversity improves uh, monetization and KPIs than uh, than ethics, but I think you kind of get one from the other, or at least a broadening of that. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of horror stories out there right now about like machine learning gone bad. Right, um, usually as a result of a lack of diversity. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think you know finding those kind of articles is a really good start for, for this kind of work. We should do it more. Yeah, well, also, maybe also about having a great diversity in, in your team is going to help trying to figure out how this, this system is going to work and to try to come up with all the different, how all the different ways it can go bad. Uh, if you only have like people that look like you uh, on the team, it's going to be very hard to come up with all these examples. Um, so that's that's a way also to. Uh, to talk and I would say to, for us, it's talking about this not just at advocacy conferences, but talking about this with the people actually working in the field, yeah. so they start being more aware. Um, last question, Nicole. I right. think. Yes. yes. Thank you. Great, Hi. great panel. Really awesome that it's here uh, at the AI Summit. And uh, my question is just an extension of the idea of like, uh, well, and in the context of Facebook, you know, I actually have a gender blocker. I, I declare myself as non-declared. Mm. Uh, and what I found is that I got less wrinkle cream and dresses <laughs> and, you know, I mean, you're going to get Zuli ads no matter which gender you choose. Um, but I thought that was a way of me as a user saying, look, I, you know, that's not what I want to see and I will go out intentionally on the net and like go to some very you know specific sites in order to kind of crack the you know the code that might be you know that's uh, the preferences that the AI is is um, is assuming about me. So my question is you know is there a lot of talk about you know getting giving users control over their uh, over the platform? Mm -hmm. Can we have a reset button? We've talked a little bit. I've heard a little bit last year about having like a reset button, not just for ads in general, but you know like my my social media feeds. I want to, you know, be able to like hit a reset button and just, you know, start from scratch. Yeah. Like I may go down a really dark path, and am I going to be able to like my way out of that dark path? Yeah. And I've got multiple personalities. I mean, not as a not not as a not as a, a medical condition, but just simply, you know, I you know I run a studio. I'm a designer. I'm also an engineer. I want to be able to, and I'm live with the environment, so I want to be able to switch. And I don't have those kind of controls either. Um, so there is this efficacy of just being like one thing for everybody, and that's mm -hmm. you know just like a fire hose, without that flexibility. So are people talking about the ethics of user control? Certainly they are. Um, the the idea of especially the right to be forgotten is like how people talk about like how, your permission to have information about you removed from the system, and there are specific applications of that under GDPR, but that could apply in a lot of other cases as well. Um, yeah, I know we don't have a lot of time to answer, so. Yeah, especially in Europe, there's a lot of people uh, thinking about that, and yeah, there's a lot of committees. Uh, in France, you have uh, the CNIL, C -N -I -L, this, uh, looking at all these questions, but yeah, in, in Europe, you can ask for your data to be removed, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily easy. It kind of no. depends on, but I, but I think <laughs> it's possible to, problems. yeah, I mean, there's, I think, but as people become conscious of that, like, building products towards a point where it becomes easier to opt out of things, um, or say, you know what, like, I, I would like to change my gender presentation now, and that's across the board, so let's acknowledge that, like, mm -hmm. all of those kinds of applications. Yeah, I mean, there's also, there is a, a flip side to that, though, that is the ethical consideration of people using that kind of tool to remove things that people should know about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, there are a lot of kind of right-to-be-forgotten cases where it's a politician who doesn't want some image to be circulating 
generally of them with some high profile donor or something. Um, you know, there's a, there's a counterpoint to the ethics, and I think there's use cases on both sides. Yeah, yeah. but I think it's also not just uh, the right to be forgotten in terms of what I publish, but as a consumer, I've got a right to, you know, adjust, you know, the difference. You know, I want to be able to go to a horror movie or a rom romantic economy or something like that. I don't have that flexibility in social media right now. I don't have, like, a wide variety of things. It's just one thing, and again, you can navigate yourself into some, like, very specific, like, feed content, and it's very hard to get out, especially if you're not a developer. I think we're going to have to continue the discussion out there. We are already over, but thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists.